Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? We begin, as has been standard form for the last few months, with information on the Wuhan coronavirus. In this case, an ironic twist and how it's bringing people together and suddenly bringing out the best in bizarre ways. Brazilian gangs are imposing strict curfews, social distancing, and other hygiene and similar behaviours to limit the spread of the Wuhan coronavirus in the Brazilian favelas. These are slums, largely uncontrolled and unenforced by the police, but the gangs have absolute and tyrannical control. They are the source of information, money, employment. They are effectively the government of these areas. As you can imagine, with a disease like the Wuhan coronavirus, areas like slums are likely to be drastically affected. They generally have poorer hygiene, less income and access to medical services, facilities and resources. This is why the main and probably most effective method to control the spread of the Wuhan coronavirus are those that involve public participation, or more appropriately, lack of public participation. Drug traffickers and other gangs are enforcing strict curfews, social distancing and similar as one of those methods. It is intended to prevent people from infecting each other or becoming infected. It's an irony that the government is effectively abandoning these areas, but the gangs are viewing it as a serious threat. And in at least one video that has been recorded, the gang members are found going around, calling out on a loudspeaker that we are imposing a curfew because nobody is taking the Wuhan coronavirus seriously. It's best to stay at home and chill. The message has been given. In another location, gangs have been distributing soap near a large fountain and have put up a sign that reads, please wash your hands before entering the favela. Considering that these are gangs in Latin South America going to such extremes, and yet GameStop can't bring itself to rise to the level of providing hand sanitizer, the gangs are recognising the danger the Wuhan coronavirus presents, and we're seeing that now in official statistics. Globally, it is thought that over 1 million have been infected. That's based on the official statistics, which may be substantially higher if China really is downplaying how bad their infection rate is. Over 1 million infected and over 51,000 have died. In the last week, just as many new cases have been diagnosed as in the 90 days prior. That's a depressing figure. This sudden spike in the rate of infection is somewhat alarming and indicates that the pandemic is spreading at a rate that we had not anticipated. Particular epicenters being Italy, China, Spain and a few other countries. Meanwhile, some countries have shown a drastic downturn in the rate of infection. And this is something to bear in mind while considering whether or not you can and should work at home. A number of campaigns have cropped up encouraging people not to travel, go out, or attend a common workplace. Instead, using the internet to access their work in some capacity. There's an interesting and useful article coming out of the conversation trying to help people do exactly that, which would hopefully increase the number of people who are not having to go into places that are common to everyone else. The article is intended to help you increase your internet speed while it is being consumed at a larger scale by the mass use of simultaneous office workers who are no longer in their office. As a general rule, the infrastructure for what is a domestic service and what is a commercial service is different and somewhat separate. Commercial services are given a higher bandwidth allowance and sometimes given priority in their service. In order to compensate for this, 
Domestic services are often given a more limited bandwidth and are not prioritized in the same way. This doesn't mean you can't do anything though. Particularly useful points are that you can either use a Wi-Fi signal booster if you intend to work wirelessly. If that doesn't work and you have the option, consider changing the settings on your router. You will find that with Wi-Fi, you may be interfering with your neighbor's signal or their signal may be interfering with yours. Switching between frequencies may allow you to avoid that issue. What might come as an irony is bandwidth usage during what was peak periods before now could actually be the optimal time to be accessing online services like streaming videos. This is because those periods were already experiencing a relatively large amount of demand and that demand is unlikely to have increased to the same degree that daytime usage has. Another unexpected but interesting occurrence with the Wuhan coronavirus spread has been the possibility of tracking it using wastewater. The idea is that the virus will be passed or at least be able to be found in wastewater coming out of toilets, showers, sinks and similar. If this is true, there is a possibility for being able to not only identify areas where it is in high concentrations, but possibly backtrack it to isolated areas and then be able to work from there in figuring out where hotspots are. These areas can then be interceded and, with any luck, those who are infected and may not know it can then be prevented from passing it on. What is better is the technology behind this is relatively idiot proof. It's more or less a strip of paper with appropriate filters and reactive agents on it. The paper is put into the wastewater, and if the Wuhan coronavirus is present, a green circle shows up. If it isn't, a blue circle shows up. Simple, to the point, and effective, but best of all, it's cheap, at about a pound or a dollar twenty-four per a test. This is the sort of technology that is being developed in response to the pandemic, but it has applications beyond and outside of it. Think about influenza. Knowing where and when hotspots are showing up would allow for more targeted public health information. And that's just a common anticipated viral disease. There are others that are less anticipated, much like the Wuhan coronavirus, and the technology could in theory be modified to work with these. It's knowing about a disease that is key to being able to do something like this, and we've now elucidated the structure of the Wuhan coronavirus's spike receptor. This is an important thing to know about, as it would allow us to more effectively develop vaccines that specifically target something that is only found on the Wuhan coronavirus. The article describing its structure can be found in Nature, and it was published this week. An important takeaway from this is that the original SARS virus has a very, very similar structure, and so we might be able to take the current vaccines for SARS and other viruses and retrofit them. It'll take a bit of time and it'll take a bit of effort, but in theory, understanding that we have a viable and very easily identified target for these vaccines may allow us to bring them to bear that much sooner. This is made more apparent by the same article that has identified the way two antibodies that target SARS are able to target the same receptor binding feature of the Wuhan coronavirus. If everything so far has left you feeling downbeat and helpless, there's actually a way to get involved with research around the Wuhan coronavirus and theoretically help. This refers back to one of our previous videos on citizen scientists and public engagement. There is research using a online game called Foldit. This is a game in which the public can figure out 
how a variety of proteins fold and assemble to achieve a particular function. It's a distributed method and scientists are able to gather a lot of data from people taking part and they've expanded it to include the Wuhan coronavirus. Another one is called Folding at Home, which allows you to dedicate a small proportion of your computer's processing power, and this can then be run for calculations. This is helpful in giving researchers access to more computing power. They can then use it to predict outbreaks or model what's currently occurring. Another is called flu tracking, and another is called patients like me. It allows people to describe their symptoms and help to track the spread of a disease. It also lets researchers test potential treatments. There are, of course, projects and similar that don't target Wuhan coronavirus. But for now, if you want more information on those, please go to the conversation article and have a look at what they have to tell you about both the current ways you can participate in the Wuhan coronavirus research and other possible public engagement research projects. Speaking of the public in general, herd immunity is not the answer. Yes, the UK has been trying to sell that as a viable option, or at least they were, but the reality is it's not going to work the way they think it will. Think of the Wuhan coronavirus as being like the seasonal flu. Approximately each year, all of those who have been exposed to it gain some sort of immunity. Arguably, the same thing occurs with those who have been exposed to the Wuhan coronavirus. This gives them immunity, and it minimizes the risk of the disease spreading. The problem is, 95% of the population is not exposed to the annual flu virus. You'll get a significant proportion of the population who is, but you don't reach the number needed because you've reduced the spread to such an extent that by the time you're beginning to approach numbers that could lend themselves towards herd immunity, it's just not spreading. We artificially overcome these barriers using vaccines. This means you can more or less avoid the issue of a natural spread of the disease throughout the population and the way you get a diminishing return over time by simply giving everybody the disease in an artificial manner and immediately getting that herd immunity. There's no petering out of an effect. There's no need to fight an uphill battle to expose people. It can be done in a controlled and safe manner. The Wuhan coronavirus would need 70% of the population to be infected in order for us to garner herd immunity. Can you imagine what effect 70% of the population being infected with this disease around the same time would have? Currently we're looking at a fraction of that and already most countries are in a state of chaos. Whether that's due to the lockdown domestic productivity, the economy, trying to access toilet paper, any number of things that could and have realistically thrown people's lives into chaos and we're nowhere near 70% of the population. That is the pragmatic and realistic impact of trying to gain herd immunity. But now let's consider the risk to life at between a 0.5 and 1% fatality rate if current statistics are thought to be accurate and 70% of a country's population was to be infected, that's going to be a lot of dead people very quickly. And if they're not dead, they need hospital care. And 1% of any population suddenly needing access to medical care is not realistic. We finally have some interesting and different news that really is bizarre. Scientists found a bee that was split down the middle. That's nothing unusual. The exact ratios are, but overall, finding a bee that's in half is not that weird. What was bizarre here is that one half was male and one half was female. As a general rule, Bees are sexually dimorphic, 
and they have a male form and a female form. Each of these produces appropriate reproductive organs and reproductive cells. And then you get the occasional bizarre thing like this. This is something known as a gynadromorph, and it has been found in most bee species to some extent. Also butterflies, birds and crustaceans, but it is practically unheard of in mammals. Fortunately for researchers, this particular example was not a dead bee, but was one that is alive, and that could help in understanding what's happening, both at a biological level and at a functional level. Next is an interesting AI system that has been able to translate the human brain signal into text, and it has a surprisingly high level of accuracy. The research team, led by neurosurgeon Edward Chang of the University of California's Chang Lab, was using a method that was able to translate the output from electrocardiograms from an implant in patient brains into text. This involved four epileptic patients who wore implants that would monitor their seizures. This generated a whole bunch of data, some of which was relevant to the experiment in question, understanding the epilepsy condition. The team then ran another experiment looking at the same data set. What they were trying to understand was what the brain was saying during the seizure. This was then compared to the video and audio recordings of the patient at the time. In the best case study that they have from this particular experiment, the AI had the ability to get a 97% accuracy. In the worst case study, the AI was unable to find any relationship between the brain signals and what was said. Finally, we have an interesting recall being conducted by the Food and Drug Administration. They have issued a recall for the heartburn drug known as Zantac. Their concern is that as it is stored, there's a high chance that the amount of contaminant will increase. This contaminant being n methylamine, or NDMA, a probable human carcinogen. It is a concern that this would be happening, and so the FDA has said that they want all of the drug pulled from all shelves. This stems from the fact that they don't know how long some of the drugs have been sitting in storage. It might have been a few weeks, it might have been a few years. Given the unknown quantity of this drug in each particular box that is purchased, a patient could be exposed to very little or a lot, and that wide range of risk is simply unacceptable. This is a good example of the FDA following up on drug control and quality testing to ensure safety. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions below.